Uh, Samir, let's start with a statement from Bertrand Russell, who is widely regarded as one of the most influential thinkers of the uh, 20th century. Um, in his book, Religion and Science, he wrote, whatever knowledge is attainable must be attained by scientific methods. And what science cannot discover, mankind cannot know. And this uh, this quote certainly ruffles people's feathers a bit. I mean, particular philosophers who might not think of themselves <laughs> as scientists. Uh, what do you what do you make of that quote? And uh, do you think his assessment is correct? Well, I don't think it's a straightforward matter, actually. In part because it's not really entirely clear what the scientific method refers to. Mm. I mean, if he means the methods that science currently uses, including the, the, the technologies, say, then it seems unlikely that everything that's in principle noble is noble via those methods. Um, so perhaps, for example, you know, some statement about what was going on in some distant, um, distant region of the universe in the distant past may not be knowable, simply because all the information has been destroyed and we can perhaps surmise uh, the truth of, of, of the proposition, but not know it for sure. Um, so I wonder, one query I would have with that statement is whether the scientific method is, is really as well-defined as Russell is presuming in that quotation. Other people in philosophy and, and elsewhere have queried the, the overall sentiment for different reasons. So some have argued that non-scientific disciplines produce knowledge such as our humanistic disciplines, including philosophy. Um, and others have argued that personal experience can be a source of knowledge and moreover can reveal information that no science can. So in, in, in a famous um, line of argument in, in, in philosophy instigated by an author called Thomas Nagel, a number of people have argued that um, there, there isn't a sort of information that in principle you can only get by having first personal experience, say such as the knowledge of um, what some substance tastes like, for example, you know, what French camembert tastes like, for example. Some people say, look, how could, you, how could anyone know that without tasting it? You know, you could have the most detailed scientific analysis of the, you know, the molecular constituents of ripe camembert, but that doesn't tell you what it tastes like. You have to you have to um, experience it. So that line of argument has sometimes been used to to combat Russell's sentiment too. Mm. Yeah, I think I mean both of those are very interesting points. Um, maybe let's start with the first one um, on the definition of the scientific method. I, I agree with you. I do find it very interesting because I I feel like not only is there not consensus, but there are actually are potentially two broad camps of of thought here. Um, that are relevant. The first, we have Thomas Kuhn's view, which kind of envisions science as progressing through paradigms in which um, scientists spend most of their time working within a particular paradigm. And then on occasion, I guess there is a sort of a paradigm shift. And then on the other hand, we have something that's more like what Paul, uh, Karl Popper would put forward, which is, um, you know, it, it envisions science as progressing by scientists actively working to falsify the the current theory or the best explanation do you feel that those two those two views are at tension here yeah there's certainly a tension between those two views uh, between the kuhn view and, and the popper view which are sort of classic rivals in the 20th century uh, philosophy of science in in the study of the scientific method or what scientific methodology as we sometimes call that discipline um so as you say that kuhn had this view that was emerged really from his studies in the history of astronomy, um, where he was impressed by these periodic revolutions which involved overturning the whole scientific worldview, uh, which, would, and pu which punctuated the progress, the process uh, the, uh, of science. And in between, Kuhn argued you had something called normal science, which was a highly conservative entity, pro a highly conservative um, inquiry, which essentially just consists in fleshing out the paradigm one is working within, but not really fundamentally testing it. So Kuhn was thinking of his, I mean, his famous, most famous example was the Copernican revolution, when the old Ptolemaic astronomy, which of course was geocentric, put the earth at the center of the solar system, was overthrown um, by Copernicus, who <clears throat> with the, the heliocentric um, 
model of the of the solar system that put the the sun at the at the center um now whether whether that model of normal science punctuated by scientific revolution and paradigm shift it really applies to every scientific discipline in every era is is rather more debatable i think and there's been a lively discussion about whether Kuhn's ideas extend beyond uh, the physical sciences, which was their original home. So many people in the life sciences, for example, have said, no, wait a minute, we don't really recognize that description of the history of science or of how scientific activity works particularly well. So, I mean, Kuhn, Kuhn's idea is certainly valuable, but I think um, not many philosophers of science would take them as the gospel truth anymore if they ever did. Um, Similarly with Popper, I mean, Popper had some, some powerful ideas, um, but his, his methodology, many of us came to feel in philosophy of science, was, was overly simplistic and not really true to what you see. So as, as you pointed out, Matt, uh, for Popper, the key idea was that scientists should advance bold, bold conjectures, as Popper put it, stick their neck out and advance some hypothesis or theory, and then spend their time trying to falsify it, trying to refute it, to get experimental evidence to disprove it. Um, and in part, Popper thought that because he thought that it was impossible to prove the truth of a scientific theory, but it was possible to disprove it, um, which in a sense is true in a, in a, in a, on a point of logic. Uh, one falsifying uh, observation can disprove a generalization but no number of positive findings can prove it um, because the, the, the generalization is potentially infinite in scope and the, the data are always finite. Um, however, it's a big jump from that and one that Popper was overly ready to make to say that science is all about trying to disprove one's hypothesis or theory. And I think many, many practicing scientists, although they often ironically cite Popper as, the, as one of their... Um, influences. Popper had, is one of the few philosophers of science to have been extremely influential in the practicing scientific community. But ironically, despite that influence, very few scientists actually do what Popper said uh, <laughs> that, they, that they should do, which is try and disprove things rather than to establish them. Yeah. So I think the Popper methodology, for different reasons to the Kuhn one, is also um, untrue to much scientific practice, mm. in my opinion. Yeah, I mean, it, it does. It does still feel like there is something intuitively resonant about Bertrand Russell's statement, and I think um, in in earlier writing he also said some things that were sort of a little bit distasteful towards philosophy, I would say, but even though he was very much a philosopher in his own right. Um, in fact, you know, through this podcast and through um, my work with um, tech startups and other things like that, I have a, a fortune of speaking with um, a lot of great scientists, a lot of great philosophers, great technologists. And often when I ask them a difficult question, they might couch their their answer with by saying something like, oh, that's a philosophical question. And sure then they'll go on to give me their their opinion, um, and I always actually sort of it reads to me as a euphemism for this question has no answer or this question has no objective answer. What, 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 what is your view? Is there is there a um, a distinction between philosophical questions and science and scientific questions? Yeah, it's that's a good question and an and an age old one. Um, my opinion is that there is, in that. The questions we ask in philosophy are not directly um, open to um, demonstration one way or the other. Mm -hmm. So in philosophy, we, we ask questions like, what is knowledge? Um, what is truth? Is truth attainable? How should humans behave? How do we reconcile? How should society reconcile the welfare of the group against the rights with the rights of the individual? Questions of that sort, which are, are age-old questions and um, are not the sort of question that admit of a final resolution uh, that, you can, that you could hope to finally answer in a way that would just settle the matter once and for all, as with some well-posed scientific questions one can do. 
say, the question of what the molecular makeup of water is, is not a matter of debate. It's, it's, a, it's something that where the truth has simply been established. We know the answer. Um, or how many miles the moon is from the earth. I mean, these are factual matters to which we know the answer. Any, if there's any debate on them, then one party is just straightforwardly wrong. But philosophical questions aren't like that. And that's why they never get resolved and have been debated for thousands of years, in fact. So that's, <laughs> that's one symptom of the difference between, a science, between some scientific questions and typical philosophical questions. Um, but I think that more fundamentally, the difference comes down to the difference between empirical knowledge and what we might call a priori knowledge. So a priori means without the benefit of experience. Uh, so the scientific method, as Russell was uh, alluding to in that quotation, is fundamentally empirical. You know, so you know, in, in scientific inquiries, you can't, with a typical scientific inquiry, you can't know or even have a reasonable belief about something without investigating it empirically, studying how it actually is. Um, so take, I don't know, take the question of whether COVID emerged from a lab leak or from the wet market in, in, in China, that, that debate. Now, we still don't really know the answer for sure, but you couldn't possibly address that question without going and looking at the evidence, looking at the empirical data. That's typical mm. of a scientific question. The way to answer it is empirical, where empirical means making observations, doing experiments, finding data. But standard philosophical questions are not really um, responsible to empirical data in quite the same way. So come back to the example I gave you a moment ago, the question of what knowledge is. What, it, what do we mean when we say that someone knows something? That's, that's one way of posing the question the, of what knowledge is, a question that goes back to Plato and before. Um, now, ask yourself, I mean, what experiments or observations could we possibly do to decide what knowledge is? I mean, we could do a survey of how people use the word, no, I suppose, but that wouldn't quite tell us what we, what the, the answer to the question, although it might in some cases be relevant. Um, and that, that I, the lesson here, I think, is that typical philosophical questions, one can adduce reasons for and against the answers that one might want to give to them, but they're not fundamentally based on empirical information in the way that um, empirical information is the arbiter of scientific um, hypotheses and, and, and propositions. So I would say that there is a fundamental difference between science and philosophy. Um, reflected in the fact that the method of inquiry in the two disciplines is really quite different. Now, the, water, the, mud, the waters get muddied a bit by the existence of the discipline called philosophy of science, which is in <laughs> fact my own discipline, which is a sub-branch of philosophy. Mm. And one of the things we do in philosophy of science is to study sort of conceptual questions that arise within the sciences and also methodological questions that arise in, in most or all sciences. So we started with the discussion about Kuhn and Popper. Those are examples of methodological questions that arise um, pretty much in, in all science. Now, I would still classify though that sort of inquiry as philosophical rather than um, scientific. So for example, one, one uh, classic question of scientific methodology is whether experimental data can ever prove that a hypothesis is true. Now, some people say, no, 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 it, it can't. Not, not in the strict sense of the word proof, in, in, in that strict sense in which we we'll say we can prove Pythagoras' theorem by purely, purely mathematical means. Uh, many people say, no, even the, mo the most powerful convincing experimental data can never prove a hypothesis in that sense of the word proof. But then we get into the question of, well, what, what experimental data can do? How rationally certain we can be about scientific hypotheses and theories, um, given if, if we grant that the data can never prove their truth in the sense in which we can prove a theorem in, in geometry, for example. 
Um, and that, I think, is a, is, a, is a philosophical question. I mean, it's a question about science, about how much certainty we can rationally place in the deliverances of science. But nonetheless, that's a philosophical question. It's not to say that only philosophers are equipped to discuss it. On the contrary, many scientists have and will weigh in on that very question too. But fundamentally, it's a question about rationality, if you like, or about what the rational response to evidence and information is, and about how much um, support evidence can give to um, an, an empirical hypothesis. And those are, I would classify as philosophical questions about science rather than scientific questions. So in short, coming back to your, your question, I do indeed see a fundamental difference between philosophical questions and scientific ones. Now, not, not all philosophers agree with that. Oh, interesting. Um, I, would, I would actually love to dig into that. Uh, for, for what reason do some philosophers not? Um, a line of argument associated in particularly with the mid-20th century philosopher and logician called W.V.O. Quine, Willard Van Orman Quine, maintained that science and philosophy are actually continuous and that it's a mistake to see a hard and fast divide between them of the sort that I've been arguing for. Um, and that was essentially because Quine didn't really believe there was a distinction between empirical knowledge of the sort that science gets you and a priori knowledge of the sort that philosophy or mathematical reasoning might get you. He thought that that very contrast didn't make sense. And as a result, advocated a position that came in some quarters to be known as naturalism, which holds, roughly speaking, that philosophy and science are on a continuum, if you like. Um, that it's not that there's a hard and fast divide between them. It's just that philosophy asks questions that are further removed from um, experimental or empirical data. Um, but so, you know, the, the theoretical reaches of, of some sciences do that too, ask questions that are really at some removed from, from the empirical data. So according to this um, Quine-inspired line of argument, there isn't a fundamental divide between the two. That's what I was thinking of when I said that some philosophers would disagree with what I've said. Yeah, I guess, I guess if we do take the, the, the sort of first view you put forward, it does pose a question of how one could make anything that we would call progress in philosophy. Um, because in science, you can imagine, even if one cannot prove a theory, um, one could at least you know, disprove, as you said earlier, and sort of cut out the space of possible hypotheses, make it smaller, or at least have enough evidence that it could sort of dr draw us towards um, a stronger belief in, in a certain region of Absolutely. hypothesis space, I guess. And, and I, I would consider, you know, mathematically, you could think of that as, as progress of a sort. But in philosophy, we don't have the ability then to appeal to, I don't know, empirical evidence. So what does, what does progress then look like in philosophy? It's a good question. And one I think that actually troubles a lot of us in philosophy, in that we spend our lives beavering away at these extremely difficult questions and um, reading difficult works and writing, in many cases, quite abstruse uh, articles in, in modern professional philosophy, often that can only be read by other philosophical specialists. And we would hate to think that uh, it's wasted effort, that we're getting nowhere. <laughs> um, so, but nonetheless, the comparison with scientific progress is unflattering for philosophy in that, as you rightly say, I think, Matt, I mean, whatever one thinks about whether you can prove the ultimate truth of scientific uh, hypotheses, I mean, it's very hard to dispute that science makes and has made extraordinary progress. Mm. Um, so I think it's very hard to dispute that science makes progress um, and te the technological um, spin-offs of science are... are, are testimonies to that, and of course, the theoretical understanding too. Um, and that, that, I think, is, is, is agreed by, by pretty much all parties, that science has indeed increased the stock of human knowledge and has, uh, as you rightly say, Matt, eliminated certain things that we once believed and given us pretty, pretty good information about all sorts of different things. Philosophy, however, doesn't seem to have made progress in quite the same way. And indeed, many of the questions that 
the ancient Greeks discussed in philosophy, in fact, pretty much most of them, are still discussed today. Should we worry about that? Well, I would say no. I would say we have made progress, great progress in philosophy. It's just that the questions we ask are not of the, not the sort that have final answers. So the progress could never take the form of, in philosophy of saying, we now know the answers to these philosophical questions and we've disproved to the earlier generations. I think the progress takes a, 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 perhaps a more subtle form in that the aim of philosophy really is clarity rather than final truth. Um, so what we're often doing in, in philosophical inquiries is really trying to shed light on debates that have interested uh, previous generations of philosophers and to pose the questions more sharply um, and more accurately. And it, in that way to, to illuminate, if you like. And I do think that the great advances in the, in the field of philosophy that we call analytic philosophy that's mm. largely a 20th century endeavor. So, you know, really only um, maximum of about 100 and, 130 years old or so, probably less, ha has indeed brought a lot of clarity. So one of the hallmarks of analytic philosophy is to use logic and careful analysis of language to really ask exactly what the question is. And by doing that, then, what analytic philosophers have managed to do is to just disambiguate many of the questions that earlier generations of philosophers argued about, and not necessarily to achieve any final answers, although perhaps some, um, but rather just to clarify what the question is in the first place. Now, that looks very different from scientific progress, I grant you, but I think it's progress nonetheless. What, one, one viewpoint that many people take when thinking about science and 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 philosophy and scientific and philosophy, philosophical questions are that many people view scientific questions and you know scientific knowledge as purely um descriptive there's you know not normative at all there are no value statements and i think bertrand russell and thomas kuhn and karl Popper, all the people we've mentioned their views seem to be roughly consistent with this way of thinking but there is one science that i think breaks the rule here in particular, um, and that is biology. Um, in biology, there is a lot of value-laden language that's, that's used. Um, so for example, if I look at the, the, the human heart, um, it's very common to say something like, um, the purpose of the heart is to pump blood, or the, the, the function of the heart is to pump blood. And you would never say that about you know, a chemical reaction doing something. You never said the purpose of this reaction is to do X, Y, and Z. Um, and so what, what does that mean then for biology as a science? Does that, uh, does that change how we think about this, this type of science? That's a, that's a very nice question. Um, let me answer it in two parts. Mm -hmm. Firstly, I agree with the general idea that science um, yields knowledge of what the world is like not what the world should be like. Mm. Um, so there's a fundamental contrast in philosophy that we make between the descriptive and the normative, where the descriptive is the, uses the language of is. It says, this is the way the world is. The normative uses the language of ought and says, this is the way the world should be in some respect. Now, David Hume, famous 17th century Scottish philosopher, um, sorry, 18th century Scottish philosopher, argued that um, one could never get from an is to an ought, that there's a fundamental gap between those, those two things. And my, my own view is that Hume is right. And I think that that's enshrined in, in the scientific worldview to some extent, in that we think of the job of the, of the scientists as just being to tell us the facts as best as possible. Um, the question of what one does with all of that scientific information then is a sort of ethical or social or political question to be assessed by, you know, by policymakers in, in part. So that's the is-ought divide. 
Now, you suggest, Matt, that maybe biology is an exception to that because of the prevalence of functional and purposive language in biology. Let me firstly say I fully agree with you about the presence of functional and purposive language in biology. You gave the example of the heart. We say that the function of the heart is to pump blood or the function of the kidneys is to remove waste products from the blood or the function of the crab skeleton is to to protect its innards or the function of the, the bird's mating display is to attract females or or whatever. So I agree with you on the face of it, that may sound normative. We might be saying that, you know, what the heart is meant to do is to pump blood around the body. And uh, a heart that doesn't do that is defective in some way. And defective is obviously a normative term. We're saying it's not doing what it should do or what it's meant to do. And that one might say, impressed by the is ought distinction, the Hume argument, well, it seems that that violates then the general idea that the job of science is to um, describe the world rather than prescribe. But ultimately, I think that that's the way it seems rather than really is, in that much um, apparently normative language, in particular purposive language in biology, can in fact be paraphrased away in, in purely descriptive terms. And according to one line of argument, what we really mean when we say that the function of some biological item is to do X rather than Y, what we're really saying is that's why, that's why natural selection produced it. So, you know, if I say that the function of uh, the salmon's um, returning to its natal home, its homing behavior uh, is in order to um, raise its offspring in, in, in a safe environment or something. Then what I'm saying is it's because the behavior, the homing behavior has that effect that natural selection led salmon to do it, if you like. So according to this line of argument, Function and purpose, talk of function and purpose in, in biology is ultimately shorthand for talking about evolution by natural selection. And so if I say that the function of the heart is to pump blood, I mean that's why hearts are there. That's why they evolved, in order because they do that. Whereas the, it's not true to say that the function of the heart is to make a, make a thumping sound, uh, even though the heart does make a thumping sound. Um, that's not why hearts evolved. That's just a side effect of their true function, which is to, to circulate the blood. So according to this line of argument, we can, we can translate away talk of function um, by paraphrasing functional language or, or for purposive language in purely descriptive terms. So in short, if that's right, it suggests that evolutionary biology or biology generally is not, in, is not in fact an exception to the rule that science deals in is rather than ought. I, um, I want to later on get back to the is ought question um, as it pertains to questions of ethics and morality, but, but I think let's spend some more time on, on this question of function for now. I think there, there are two things that come to mind here. Um, if, if we are to take the view that what we're really doing when we use value-laden language here is pointing towards you know, evolutionary purpose or you know, the reasons for things having evolved. Um, the first idea here is that you know, for, the, the, for the vast majority of, of um, you know, uh, written history, um, the theory of evolution was not known. And um, you know, science was still, still done, even in a period where biology was, was thought of as a science. The theory of evolution was was not understood, and functional language was used, uh, and in fact, it was used uh, even earlier on in in other sciences as well. Um, but maybe let's start with with that. Um, how does that then um, apply to this this case where p functional language was used, and and I think we're saying 
it was used for a purpose that actually was was not known um, at some point in history. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a fair point. Um, so to, to take a concrete example of that, I mean, so many many school children know that uh, it was William Harvey who who discovered that the function of the blood is to, sorry, the function of the heart is to pump, um, is to pump blood around the body. And of course, he was writing many. Uh, many, many centuries before Darwin, mm. in which, the, so at a time when the theory of evolution was not known, and where almost everybody believed instead in in, in bipriation, uh, almost everybody in the in the, in, the, in the Western uh, Christian world, that is, believed in biblical creation. Um, but nonetheless, Harvey was able to discover that the function of the heart is to pump blood. And so you might say, well, then how can it be plausible to try and analyze away that language in terms of evolution and natural selection, given that he was using that language long before the discovery of theory? But in response to that, we might say, well, look, we're not really trying to give an analysis of what every person who's used the term function has meant. Rather, what we're doing is trying to point to the underlying scientific facts that make talk of function sort of scientifically possible or scientifically respectable in biology. So the basic idea would be, well, I mean, functional talk gets a grip in biology, but not in chemistry or geology, precisely because the organisms that we find in biology and their, and their sub-constituents, their cells and molecules of which they're made, appear to be designed for a purpose. Now, some people, you know, in the pre-Darwinian era, thought that they really had been designed in, by a conscious designer for a purpose. But what Darwin did is essentially to show that natural selection was the designer, if you like. So there was no intelligent designer; rather, the entity organisms came to um, be like incredibly well-designed machines very well adapted to their environmental conditions because of natural selection. However, what really vindicates the functional talk is the fact of apparent design, if you like. And the the design being merely apparent, which is what Darwin showed us, rather than real as proponents of of a theistic worldview believe, doesn't really matter insofar as our ability to uh, correctly identify the functions of things is. So that would be, I think, uh, one way of responding to the the objection that you that you point out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess that that makes sense. So you know, this this language happens to be um, you know subjective or value laden in in other contexts, but in in this case, um, it makes sense and is appropriate Um, but it does then um, lead to a second objection and this actually i think a very famous objection that was first put forward by um, stephen jay gould and richard lewinton in the 70s i think they wrote a very impactful paper um, arguing that um, those i think they call it the adaptationist view you know trying to um, describe traits of biological organisms by appealing to their evolutionary origins. Um, they they claimed that this was not really a real science because people would be able to look at basically any trait and come up with a very convincing sounding story uh, explaining the origin and therefore the purpose of the trait. And, you know, this would be the functional language we just talked about. But, um, you know, these origin stories, I think, could often not be true um, or that we would have no means of knowing whether this was the true purpose or origin or or function of this trait um, and this is i think this is very common today in the field of evolutionary psychology and the um the popularizations of of that so um how do you think about that objection are, are gould and lewinton right in this case um it, yeah i mean it's a complex matter my my own view is that gould and lewinton did have a point although they overstated it somewhat, but that the correct response to the point is not to abandon what they call the adaptationist um, approach 
it, it, to to evolutionary biology, but rather to do it better, if you like. Um, so, it, the, as you as you point out, Matt, then one of their key worries was that, but because of their predilection for using the language of function and purpose, that what many evolutionists within within professional biology um, were doing, according to Gould and Lewontin in, in this famous 1977 paper, was to simply advance what they call just so stories. And that was a reference to, to Rudyard Kipling's children, children's books, you know, How the Tiger Got Its Stripes, that, that series of books. Um, so according to Gould and Lewontin, then researchers were simply deciding ahead of time that every feature or trait, as we say, of every organism had been designed by natural selection for a purpose, and would they just invent hypotheses about what that purpose or function was, what the benefit it was, uh, that it conferred on organisms was, uh, without really having a good methodology for determining whether those functional claims are true or not. So in short, their charge was that people were not behaving, as Popper said, the good scientists should behave, namely actually testing um, a hypothesis. Rather, they were just assuming ahead of time that um, every interesting feature of every organism had evolved by natural selection for a specific purpose, and then hypothesizing or guessing about what that purpose was, but without any good way of telling whether the guess was true. So this was a fairly damning, sweeping critique that Gould and Lewontin made of a mode of reasoning within professional biology, um, a sort of Darwinian-inspired mode of reasoning that was in fact probably more prevalent in the UK than in the US, where they were making the charge, in that in, 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 in the UK, there's always been a stronger commitment to the Darwinian adaptationist um, paradigm within within biology, um, and and in in the in the in the public at large probably too. However, what what's the right response to the points that Gould and Lewontin were making? So let I me mean, take one of their one of their famous examples. They said, "Look, think of the human chin, right? I mean, it would be quite wrong." They said to try and reason as follows: Well, all humans have a chin, therefore the chin must have been produced by natural selection for a purpose, and so therefore maybe. The, the, the function of the chin is X, Y, and Z. Because they pointed out that the chin is just an inevitable byproduct of the growth of the jaw, just as a, it, it's a purely anatomical consequence of the way that the jawbone grows. Uh, and not all, not all other great apes have chins. So um, it, 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 that's what they meant by a spandrel or a side effect. They said it's just a side effect of the construction of the organism that it has this feature, and it would be it would be quite wrong to try and ask the qu a question about what the adaptive advantage of the chin is. There's none. They said so. That's an example of one of their lines of reasoning. But I think the question we have to ask is not whether they had a point. I mean, they did, I think most people agree they did have a point. But what the right way of dealing with that point is, um, and I think that the, the, the answer to that, in my opinion, is that you need a, raw, you need a more robust methodology. You need, to be sh you need to make a clear distinction between things that can, are known pretty much for sure and things that are still sort of hypothetical guesses. Um, and you need a clear way established way of testing adaptive hypotheses to try and determine if they're true. But I think in the, in the, um, the 50 or so years since Gould and Lewontin wrote that famous article, the situation has changed a lot. And I think evolutionary biology, through a combination of molecular methods, use of molecular information, and more sophisticated statistical methods for testing hypotheses, and more advanced modeling efforts by people making uh, theoretical models of how evolution works have sort of raised their game. And so in my opinion, the Gould and Lewontin critique um, 
it doesn't really apply as much as it did once. So I would give a sort of nuanced answer to your question. I think they did have a point, and it was a valid point and one that we still need to bear in mind, but it's not fatal to the enterprise of giving adaptive explanations. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's actually a really important fact, actually, that you mentioned that we have made a lot of progress in this domain because I think these sorts of stories are often used to justify real world decisions and um, how people think about the world. Um, w- w- one of the one of the quotes that um, I, I remember reading was one from Noam Chomsky, and he said something like, you know, you find that people cooperate and then you say, yeah, it's, of course, it's because it contributes to their genes perpetuating. Um Or you say you find that they fight and then you say, yeah, that's obvious because it contributes to their genes perpetuating and not somebody else's. Um, And so this uh, this goes back to to their point. Um, But I think that, you know, that also if you apply that to a real world situation and you come up with the, the wrong story and it's not a scientifically backed story, you could then perhaps, for example, infer that people are just like a particular way and all the things that that could lead to. You know, historically we have... um, uh, things that go as far as eugenics, uh, as an example of a of a consequence of having a wrong view here. Yeah, I mean the whole business of the application of evolutionary reasoning to humans is um, obviously fraught with danger, and um, we have the unfortunate history of eugenics and of the social Darwinism movement to bear in mind, and of the rather unfortunate debates about race and IQ in in the US particularly, I mean, there's a lot of um, difficult history that one has to uh, be mindful of if we're you know, concerned to apply evolutionary reasoning to human behavior um, or to seek genetic bases of, of complex human behaviors. Uh, that, no, that's, that's absolutely right. I mean, I think you're, the example you give from Chomsky is a nice one. I mean, and that's incidentally exactly the sort of thing that Popper had in mind when he insisted on the <laughs> the methodology of falsification. He said, look, it's no good mm. to, you can always find in something that confirms or seems to confirm your theory. You know, if your theory fits the facts, whatever those facts are, then that's not good. That's bad, mm. right? And as you <laughs> say, I mean, if we can explain both the human propensity to cooperate and the human propensity to fight in exactly the same way by saying, oh, it's just a matter of spreading your genes, it's basic Darwinian logic, then it, that is problematic. I mean, because, but again, I mean, the response in that case that I would make is to say, well, we need to have a more accurate description of the phenomenon itself before coming up with evolutionary explanations for it. So humans cooperate, yes, in certain contexts in certain institutional settings, um, but not in others. And similarly, humans fight sometimes in certain contexts, but you know, a, a careful anthropological or sociological analysis of that will reveal that it's not just sort of random, if you like. There are significant regularities um, or generalizations one can make about when humans cooperate and when they don't and when they fight and when they don't. Um, and until we have a sort of better description of the, the pattern of behavior itself, we, we shouldn't really try and construct evolutionary explanations at all. And of course, in, in, the, in, the, in the human case, the, the evolutionary explanation will only be part of the story because culture plays such a, a significant a role in determining human behavior, culture and social institutions. Um, that it would be quite wrong to think that there would, there's a, a very direct connection between um, humans' genes and what the natural selection has, has selected our genes for and our behavior. I mean, there is at a very broad level of analysis, but at the level at which we're typically interested, then the, the differences in human behavior are almost certainly more the result of cultural environmental influences than genetic ones yeah i mean that leads very very nicely to a, one of the traits that's really right at the center of human life um, which are our moral and ethical sensibilities and um, in particular altruism 
Um, I think that that pertains to the first part of Chomsky's quote. I mean, as as with um, other human shapes you talked about, I think you, as you said, the, you know, the scientific consensus is that there are aspects of this that have evolutionary roots, and maybe there are cultural influences and so on. Um, but I would like to explore the evolutionary roots then, in light of we've what we've just talked about. I mean, the evolutionary origin of something like altruism it's a, it's a big topic in itself, and um, could could warrant a podcast but perhaps we could just briefly set the picture here on our leading theory for um evolutionary origins of altruism because i think this this will lead very nicely back to the no autrum is point that we talked about earlier on which i want to get to um so maybe we need to touch on concepts like levels of, of selection and group selection and kin selection and those things but um could you quickly set the the picture for me here on on this question yeah I mean, I think, first of all, we need to distinguish whether we're talking about humans or non-humans, because the term altruism you know, is used in, in biology in one sense and is used in, um, in application to humans, in, in both in, in the field of psychology, but also in, in day-to-day um, conversation in, in a slightly different sense. There's a relation between the senses, but they're different. So let's firstly talk about the biological sense. So what one means in, in biology when one describes um, some animal behavior as altruistic is that it imposes a cost on the, the actor, the organism that does the, the, the action, but benefits someone else. So, you know, sharing one's limited food supply with other members of the social group or something would count as altruism. An animal that does that gets less food for itself uh huh. So its own survival is presumably reduced, but it enhances that of that of someone else. And now, this immediately raises the question of how altruistic behaviour, which is rel- which in that sense is relatively common throughout the animal kingdom, and indeed not just the animal kingdom, we find in in microbes, in particular in bacteria, remarkably engaged in um, in in similar sorts of behaviours behaviors that are individually costly, but that benefit others, um, such as releasing certain, producing certain chemicals that will free up you know, iron for bacterial metabolism into the local environment, but other bacteria will be the beneficiaries, not the, anim- not the bacterium that produces the, uh, the, the, the chemical in question, which is costly to produce. So altruism of that sort is common. Uh, throughout the the living world, and immediately that that raises a puzzle. I mean, for, from a Darwinian perspective, our natural sort of first expectation is that animals and organisms should evolve behaviors that increase their own chances of surviving and reproducing, not those of others. Right. So then, how can the existence of altruism be reconciled? with basic Darwinian principles, with the basic Darwinian idea that, you know, there's a competition between individuals and individuals who exhibit behaviors that bring the most chance of surviving and reproducing will prosper and spread their genes vis-a-vis ones that behave altruistically, for example. Now, this puzzle was indeed fully appreciated by Darwin himself, um, both in The Origin of Species and even more so in his 1879 book, The Descent of Man, in which in a, in a famous passage, Darwin posed the quest, the puzzle of altruism, by saying, imagining how um, altruistic behaviors had evolved in early hominids. So Darwin in particular was talking about early hominids who were willing to, to sacrifice themselves for the good of others in their tribe or group. So as Darwin famously put it, he said, he who was ready to sacrifice his life would often leave no offspring to inherit his noble nature. So in saying, with that quotation, Darwin was precisely saying, look, there's a puzzle here. We've got the theory of natural selection, leads us to assume that individuals will look out for themselves. But then we've got the existence or supposed existence of self-sacrificial tendencies in early hominids. How do we square them? Now, 
There are a number of possibilities. I mean, one possibility, and this is what Darwin hit on himself in that, in that same uh, discussion in The Descent of Man, is that natural selection may in fact be, favor- be operating at the group level, not the individual level. So it might be that in group-on-group competition, groups containing lots of altruistically inclined individuals who look out for the common good will prosper over groups containing selfish ones. And so it might be that we need to think of selection between groups, not just between individuals, to understand how altruism evolved. That's one, that's one theory, sometimes called group selection, also known as multi-level selection. Another idea um, that in some, is related in a way, although came arrived by a very different route, and in fact, it wasn't the true relation between this idea that I'm about to expound and the group selection idea um, only, only came to be understood relatively recently. But in any case, this second idea is sometimes called kin selection. And this is associated particularly with authors like W.D. Hamilton, the Oxford biologist, an inspiration for Richard Dawkins, and it's at the heart of much of Dawkins' early work, is the idea that we need to think in genetic terms. And the key observation here is that altruistic behavior in the, the animal world is not usually just directed at random members of the population. So it's, it's not generally the case that an altruistic organism will behave altruistically just to anybody, but is rather to their relatives or to those who are in close proximity to them, who statistically often tend to be their relatives in, in many, many animal communities. And that changes the accounting fundamentally because you see relatives share genes. So, so long as an organism is behaving altruistically towards fellow altruists, sorry, so, towards its genetic relatives who share its genes, uh-huh, then it's likely that the benefit of the altruistic behavior will be falling on other people who also have the genetic uh, traits that leads to the altruism. So in that way, it can be, in fact, a mechanism by which genes that encode altruistic behavior can spread through a population, so long as they cause the, the organisms in which they're found to be altruistic towards other organisms that also have the gene, or more likely than random to have the gene, to to be precise, Uh, then altruism can spread. So in short, this is the idea of kin selection, which posits that there's a simple way of explaining in natural selection terms how altruism could evolve simply by appealing to the fact that um, organisms typically behave altruistically towards their relatives, not to randomly chosen members of their population. So that's, that, that's biological altruism, altruism in the biological domain, where we've got the group selection idea, the kin selection idea, and the fraud history of debate between those that still, still goes on to some extent, or the situation is much clarified now. Okay, so that's biological altruism. Now, I said um, a moment ago that when we talk about altruism, we've got to distinguish a bit between the use of the term in biology and uh, where it's a sort of semi-technical term, if you like, to refer to behavior that's individually costly but benefits others, and the use of the term in reference to humans. So many authors have talked about what they call psychological altruism. And psychological altruism refers to behaviors or actions that are done with the express intention of helping others, that are, that are personally costly, but where the aim is to help others. And that's sort of subtly different from the evolutionary or biological altruism notion. Because you see a bacterium that releases some chemical into the local environment obviously isn't consciously trying to help anyone. Um, you know, it doesn't have a mind. So it would be a, a nonsense to say that it was trying to help other bacteria in its, in its social group or something. Um, but in the human case, then 
fairly much uh, human behavior, is not, though not all, is done for consci- with conscious intentions underpinning it. And so we can sensibly say, look, did that person perform the action because they were genuinely trying to help or were they just trying to look good in the eyes of someone else? So when you, you, know, when you help that old lady across the road, um, is it because you really wanted to help her or you just wanted to impress some onlooker to show them you were a nice guy for whatever reason? So in the human case, we can make that fundamental distinction between um, actions in terms of the intent to help versus not. Um, so we need to. So when we ask whether there's a biological basis for human altruism, we immediately have to say, well, what do we mean by human altruism? You know, do we mean altruism in that psychological sense, or do we just mean altruism in the same sense in which we talk about altruism in ants and bacteria, namely in doing things that in fact help others but um, are costly to oneself? So I think the, the, the question of the, the biological basis for altru- human altruism is complicated by that, by that sort of semantic or conceptual distinction. And it's also complicated by the fact, the general fact that we've alluded to already, that you know, much complicated, interesting human behavior um, is only under very loose genetic control, if any, if you like, in that, I mean, clearly our genes in a way, affect our aspects of our mind and our brain and our psychology, but don't directly determine how we behave in a, in a day-to-day fashion. I mean, culture is a far stronger determinant of that, I think, in the human case. Um, so wondering whether there's a biological basis for human altruism is, um, is, is complicated for that reason too, namely that the, the attempt to um, find biological bases for human behaviors is typically not particularly successful. I mean, it's not to say that genes are nothing to do with human behavior at all, but at the level of grain at which one is typically interested. Yeah, um, specifically, if you, if you look at, if, you're, if your concern is with differences in human behaviors between people in different parts of the world, for example, genetics are unlikely to be anything to do with it. Yeah, there there is that lens, though. Um, I mean, as as you say, altruism could have sort of many different layers to it, and there there might be sort of a, a quote unquote purely genetic compo- uh, genetic component, um, and then there might be others that are sort of much more nuanced. But at bottom, I think everyone would agree that um, you know even the, the 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 quality of the human mind, the nature of the human mind, what it can do. At bottom, this is something that has um, evolved and does have evolutionary origins. And I think this comes back very nicely to the ought versus is question that we discussed earlier, because altruism and, um, in fact, any other sensibilities we have, um, they are, however many layers we, we have on top of them, they're, they're somehow at, the, at, at bottom are determined by the structure and nature of our minds. And... Um, you know, we we said that the the most standard view. I would almost actually say it's it's taken as almost like a principle in philosophy that there is there is no ought derivable from an is. But if you think about it, moral sensibilities um, are. I mean, they they emerge from this this process of of evolution and everything on top of it, and that is a pure is process. That is a purely descriptive thing that happens, and so all of the ought. Um, exists somehow within a um, a universe of is, and so how how, how do you think about this uh, this issue? Yeah, no, that's a nice way nice way to put it. I mean, I suppose my my own take on it will be this. I'm not saying this is is an established fact in philosophy exactly, but it's it's how I would look at it myself. So I, I I'm a believer in the is or distinction. I I agree with the the principle that you can't get an ought from an is, and that science at most gives us is, not ought. But it's not to say that doesn't mean there can't be a science of morality, because you see evolutionary explanations of you know, human morality and human moral psychology and human moral behavior are really explaining why it is that humans 
behave in a certain way or or have certain moral beliefs and make moral are disposed to make the moral judgments that they do. So why is it that we think that you know uh, cheating is is wrong or dodging tax is wrong or hurting people is wrong or that sort of thing? Those are I mean, if if it's if it's plausible that we can art we can give evolutionary explanations of why humans typically believe things like that, um, then that still isn't to get an is an ought from an is. That's to that's to use an is theory, and it's a scientific theory in this case, evolutionary theory, to explain another is which is the fact that humans have the moral beliefs that they do. But what, you, what that doesn't show is that the moral beliefs are true or false. And it's that last bit that you can't get from science alone. And indeed, some philosophers would even go so far as to say that there's no, there's no fact of the matter. There's no truth there anyway. Yeah. I think people who are not maybe as schooled in... Um in this philosophical question, um, I think can maybe take the no ought from is statement as maybe less sort of logically robust as it potentially is and and maybe take it into sort of more every day. Um, because I think what we're saying is, you know, there you, you could scientifically show that perhaps, you know, the vast majority of humans would share some sort of moral sensibilities and we could say that the the reason that that happens does have evolutionary roots and so on and 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 other things, but you could imagine constituting a brain differently such that those sensibilities wouldn't be held, and I guess in in that sense you know no ought from is makes sense, but there are still truths that almost every single person um, would would hold or sort of at least beliefs that almost every single person would hold, um, and so is 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 that consistent with your view here? There's sort of like this abstract theoretical sense in which no autrum is holds, but nevertheless, there are views that are consistent across basically all of humanity. Yeah, I mean, I think that's compatible with what I'm saying. Um, so, although I say, I'm, I'm, I mean, I think if you look at humanity at different times, then, I mean, things that are, are, are commonplace moral beliefs now were not necessarily, you know, 300 years ago less mm. let alone a thousand years ago uh you know if you think of the prevalence of institutions you know such as slavery for example that is abhorrent to every human being alive now almost or without exception um was was largely taken for granted for much of human history as just uh, you know part of the world, the fabric of the world and in or if not explicitly justifiable um so i mean i do think that there has been you know moral change and hopefully what i would call moral progress although not in the same sense in which we get scientific progress over the course of humanity um but even if even if there were some invariant um moral beliefs or judgments that all humans at all times have been disposed to make and that were sort of deeply rooted in um in the in in the way that the the human brain works or something and there was a convincing evolutionary explanation of that i would still be inclined to say that that still isn't getting an ought from an is exactly um because you see people i mean people who practice the discipline of ethics or moral philosophy which is you know sub branch of 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 contemporary philosophy they not always but generally they are not too impressed with the idea that evolution is going to help them in their endeavor. In that they don't, it's not that they deny the truth of evolution or that they deny that evolutionary explanations of human moral um, judgments and moral behaviors and moral psychology is possible, but they just say that doesn't answer the question that interests them. Whereas the question that interests them is what is right? What is wrong? What should we do? How should people behave? How should society regulate itself in certain respects? And they say no science can can tell us the answer to that. At most, the science could tell us why people think that the answer to the quest to those questions is X rather than Y. But they want to know whether the answer is X rather than Y. 
and they typically believe that philosophical reflection is the only way to establish that. Um, and so that's why they, they without, while not disputing evolution, I think many of my colleagues in the, in, in the field of ethics are unpersuaded that their um, inquiries you know, need to really attend to evolutionary matters. I mean, they may be wrong, of course, but that's, uh, that's what a lot of professional uh, ethicists or moral philosophers believe. Yeah, it's, um, it does, though, bring us back right to the beginning of this conversation where we talked about progress in philosophy and science and what constitutes a philosophical question versus a scientific one. And uh, perhaps it's a, it's a conversation for another day, but um, if, if those people do believe that these questions are in the realm of philosophy, then I think we need to revisit um, the <laughs> discussion we had at the beginning about progress in, philosoph in philosophy and answering philosophical questions. Yeah, no, that's right. I mean, it does lead us right back to, to that vexed question of whether there's progress in philosophy and whether the philosophical method can float free, or philosophical inquiry, let's say, can, can float free of scientific inquiry or not. I mean, there's a sort of growing minority of people in, in philosophy who, is a, um, a, 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 who subscribe to what's called naturalism that I mentioned earlier, um, which they, they often take to be the view that, you know, in order to make advances in philosophy, you have to attend to what the sciences say. And although I myself am a philosopher of science and love science, I, 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 I'm neutral on that question in that I think that in reality, many philosophical inquiries, particularly in fields such as ethics and metaphysics um, and epistemology, Although it's useful to, and, and instructive to bring those discussions into contact with science, ultimately many of the questions that are discussed in those disciplines are questions to which no scientific information is, also, is really relevant. Yeah, well, I, I, Samir, I know our time is short, so um, maybe let's bring our listeners towards uh, your books and, and what you're working on. Um, you've written several very interesting books on these topics and others. Um, if people want to, to find out more, dig deeper into these topics, where would you send them? Where should they look? I've written two, two books in the Oxford University Press very short introduction series um, that I, I, I think might be relevant to, to, to readers, depending on how much they, they know about these topics. So one of those is called Philosophy of Science, a very short introduction, and the other is called Philosophy of Biology, a very short introduction. And they give a sort of synoptic overview of these two sub-disciplines of philosophy, uh, which is where I've done most of my work. That's the, fir the first sub-discipline being philosophy of science, and the second sub-discipline being you know, a subset of philosophy of science, that's the philosophy of biology, which addresses sort of conceptual questions within the modern biosciences. So these discussions that we've been having about function and altruism and adaptationism and Gould and Lewontin, they're all covered in that little book. But the first book, by contrast, the philosophy of science one, deals with the Kuhn versus Popper issues that we talked about, the question of the scientific method, how much certainty we can have in the results of science, general questions in the field that are, pertain to, to all of scientific inquiry rather than to one discipline in particular. So yeah, if you haven't read those ones, I would uh, encourage uh, readers to. Although I should say they're, I mean, they're, they're, they're short books and are relatively introdu introductory, um, but they are written in a way that I hope makes them accessible to anyone, irrespective of how much philosophy they know, in that unlike many philosophy books, what I tried to do when I wrote those is to sort of minimize philosophical jargon and just write in as plain spoken a manner as possible. Yeah. And, and in general, that's a, it's a very nice book series. I remember, um, at Christchurch College in the library, they had the what looked like the entire uh, selection of them all across the shelf there. And so I got to, to delight myself. So definitely worth a read. Um, on the topic of books, um, which book have you most gifted to other people and why? Which book have I most gifted to other people and why? Well, I've given Richard Dawkins The Selfish Gene to many, many people. 
I must say. Uh, um, sorry, I thought I thought you were saying that you had given Richard Dawkins a copy of no, 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 the Selfish no. Gene. It's, his his <laughs> book, The Selfish Gene, yeah. I've 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 yeah. given as uh, Christmas gifts and mm. gifts to to many people over the years. Um, although it's, I mean it's it's an extremely well known book by now, and its its lessons have largely been assimilated, I I, I think, by many people, you know, who by many sort of academic writers and with an interest in. In, in in evolutionary biology, I still th- think it's it's an extremely powerful and compelling uh, message. Not one that I would say people should swallow wholesale uncritically, uh, but I still can think of no more, no better written, more instinct, instantly interesting and arresting popular science work than that one. I mean, Richard Dawkins is not a big fan of philosophy. Um, but like, but I'm, I'm a big fan of, of, of his work. Mm. Well, likewise. Um, uh, next question is what advice would you give to somebody who wanted to succeed in your field? I mean, the key in philosophy of science is really the integration of the science and the philosophy. I mean, so you have to know a lot of science, but you also have to have a, a philosophical sensibility. And neither of those on its own is, is really enough. Um, and so, I mean, many people come into philosophy of science by, because they started out you know, studying science, but they always felt that you know, standard sort of science curricula, particularly laboratory heavy sciences, just didn't really scratch the itch that, you know, that they had, that they always were you know, asking some question that the teacher didn't really want to answer, like questions, what does it really all mean? How do you know that's true for sure? That sort of thing. And so I think that that can often be a symptom that someone is attracted to philosophy of science, uh, but it's not the only way into the subject. So in practical terms, I would say that, I mean, philosophy of science is a difficult subject to get into because you have to, you basically have to you know, have a PhD in philosophy, but also many people will have a, you know, a training up, sometimes up to PhD level in science too. And that's a lot of study. And that requires a lot of funding, unfortunately. So it's not, it's not always the most accessible discipline, academic discipline to enter, simply because the sort of knowledge barrier to getting into it is really quite high and has increased over time. So I would say, that, you know, the key in part is self-study. You know, no one's an expert in anything, but in philosophy of science, we do have to try and be experts in the bit of science we're interested in, though obviously not the whole of science. Yeah. And also in, in, in philosophy itself, and there's not really any shortcut. So, you know, working hard and self-study, I think, is, is the key. Mm. It's a good. Uh, it's a good bit of advice. Um, my final question, perhaps a little bit off topic, but um, I think very relevant for the times we live in. Uh, my question is: Imagine looking forward to the day, which many people think is coming very soon, in which we're visited by an AI superintelligence. My question to you is: Who from humanity, the past or present, should represent us to this superintelligent other? Oh, that's a difficult one. I mean, you mentioned Bertrand Russell. I think he would have a case. Nelson Mandela, maybe. Good answers. You can't go. You can't go wrong with Nelson Mandela for sure. Um, uh, Samir, thank you so much for joining me. It's been a pleasure speaking with you. Not at all. Thank you, Matt.